Welcome to the Friday seminar. It's really a pleasure today to have Didier Preussen uh, from Heidelberg uh, as our seminar speaker. Uh, Diederik uh, got his PhD in 2011 at Utrecht University in the, in the Netherlands. And then he had uh, a very fast career after that because he became uh, a first a postdoc at MPA, then a Gleiser Fellow at MPAA in, in Heidelberg. Then he became uh, a, a Emmy Nutter Fellow and also won the prestigious ERC starting grants in respectively 2016 and 2017. So with, two, with these two big grants, he set up a very uh, large and successful group uh, in Heidelberg at the university, uh, working on many topics that are a kind of the intersection between uh, star formation, stellar cluster dynamics and evolution, and galaxy formation and evolution. And recently, in the last two to three years, he has also pushed a lot in the direction of connecting star formation and star cluster uh, evolution, especially the, the clustering uh, uh, itself, to uh, the uh, formation and evolution of planets, of exoplanets in our galaxy. Uh, he has already made many important contributions to all these fields, despite the young age. In fact, he, he even got uh, prizes already, such, such as the Bierman Prize from the German uh, Astronomical Society in, uh, I think, 2015 or 16, so not, not far, quite not long ago. 17. Uh, and um, I can mention, uh, for example, his uh, very new uh, uh, work and, and, and novel approach to connect the cloud scale and the larger scale feedback processes to understand how star formation proceeds in galaxies. He has been author of more than one nature paper on this topic. And then also the uncertainty principle formulation, which is a really different view how to understand star formation in, in galaxies across different scales. But I think I, I, I'll stop here and, and let you enjoy the talk, which will be a stellar clustering connecting formation and evolution of galaxies to the formation and evolution of us. I'm now unmuted. Yes, that works. Thank you so much, Lucio. I'm, uh, I'm blushing. Uh, <laughs> That, that was a lovely introduction, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's been six years since the last time I was here. It's always lovely to come back. And uh, it's actually also the first time since March 2020 that I'm giving an in-person talk. So this is really awkward. And uh, if I, in the middle of the talk, suddenly stop to check the chat or so, please excuse me. That's just, you know, still getting used to getting over COVID and everything. So I, uh, I, I'm just really thrilled to be able to give an in-person seminar. Um, so yeah, as, as Lucio mentioned, I, I would like to talk about the clustering of stars and their formation and, and thereafter and how that has shaped our origins from the formation and evolution of galaxies like the Milky Way to the formation and evolution of planetary systems like our solar system. And to start that, I would really like to begin by looking at the largest possible scale. And this used to work, but now it doesn't. So I'll do this. That doesn't work either. I think now it should work. Okay, so this is the, the, the largest scale in which we can look at the universe, right? This is the cosmic web taken from illustrious TNG. And we're looking at many megaparsecs on each side. You see the clustering of the universe here. And when I look at an image like this, I try to imagine that in every pixel, you've got countless planets. And in every pixel, potentially, Somebody might be alive. And that is a very sort of intimidating idea, but, but the goal that, that that instills on me is that I would like to connect these things. I would like to understand, okay, how do we go from those large scales to that? And of course, that's a, that's a, a very intimidating question because there is a huge dynamic range in between these two scales, right? Going from there to there is of the order eight, orders of magnitude in spatial scale. And bridging that gap is an enormous challenge. And that makes one, our existence actually one of the very biggest multi-scale astrophysics problems. So to bridge this gap, of course, you don't try and do that in one go. You, you, you cut it up in steps to try and understand exactly what the relevant physical processes are in each step. So the first thing you do is you try and understand, okay, within this large-scale structure tracing the dark matter in the universe, how do the baryons 
coalesce, assemble, and form galaxies. And within those galaxies, in these gaseous structures that you see here, how do the stars form? And how clustered are they at birth? What are the stars doing? And around those stars, going further down in spatial scale, here we've only done seven orders of magnitude here so far. Going down in spatial scale, another four orders of magnitude, what do the protoplanetary disks around those stars look like? And how do planets form within them? And as, as a, a star and galaxy formation person by, by, by nature and nurture, I always think that we're almost there, right? Now we're at protoplanetary disks. Clearly, we're nearly at planets. Turns out there's another seven orders of magnitude in spatial scale here. I, I always greatly underestimate that step. So, so this is challenging. This is really daunting. And it's absolutely necessary to cut it up in this way. What you see here is I put the stellar cluster sort of in the middle. And that's for a reason, because it turns out that the stellar clustering is critical in all of those steps. And the first thing that, uh, you, that you can look at, if you actually look to larger scales, the stellar clusters and the stellar clustering, the clustering of stars, drives the baryon cycle within galaxies. It drives how the baryons are turned into stars and then blown out of the galaxy again. And from that process across cosmic history, at some point, the stellar clusters are left. And the clusters that are long-lived can be used to then trace galaxy formation and assembly and figure out how galaxies like the Milky Way formed. So it's actually, this is a, really a two-way process here where you can basically look at the relation between stellar clustering and galaxy formation. And then looking at smaller scales, the clustering of stars at birth perturbs and destroys protoplanetary disks dynamically and through radiative effects. And then finally, as I'll show towards the end of the talk, stellar clustering over longer timescales actually also modifies the properties of the planet population quite substantially across the planet population at large. And this is a new result that we've only really just started to try and understand. So I'll start with the first of those here. How does stellar clustering drive the baryon cycle within galaxies? And this is a major question because it turns out that the clustering of star formation and stellar feedback, so the deposition of energy and momentum into the surrounding interstellar medium, is really the critical unknown in galaxy formation modeling. And it's because it, it completely determines galaxy properties in a way. So what I'm showing here is, a, is a, by now a relatively old result from Phil Hopkins, who simulated exactly the same initial conditions of a forming galaxy, exactly the same uh, uh, input physics, except for the star formation model. So the criterion used to convert gas into stars. So here, uh, basically, the gas particles needed to be self-gravitating. Here, they needed to exceed a certain density threshold. Here, the gas needed to be in the molecular phase in order to form stars. You see that just by changing that one little element, the properties of the galaxy that you get out change radically. The same happens for feedback. So this is work uh, that we did last uh, this year with, with Ben Keller. Again, exactly the same initial conditions. The only thing that was changed here was the delay time for supernova feedback. So how long after the formation of a star particle would you wait until you set off your supernova explosion? And again, you see that there are radical fundamental changes to the structure of the galaxy that you get out. Now, th this would all be fine if we knew what the right answer was. But the problem is, is that many of those choices really make sense and it's not known which of them captures the correct physics. So we're kind of at a loss. And this is really a complex problem because stellar feedback is a combination, a, a nonlinear combination of all kinds of different feedback mechanisms. We've got stellar winds and supernovae, the radiation from the stars exerts, uh, causes photoionization, exerts radiation pressure. And what we've been working on within our group over the past years is to try and constrain this problem observationally actually go to the real universe and try and solve this by observing the feedback momentum and energy that's being input into the surrounding interstellar medium by observing the time scales over which the interstellar medium is being moved. And that I would like to share with you. So um, basically the question you can ask if you want to know how stellar clustering and the, thereby feedback shapes galaxies, you first need to understand what the impact is of feedback on the molecular molecular cloud population in galaxies, because that's where the stars are forming. So the stars form within molecular cloud, you want to know what the stars are doing. And a way of sort of recasting this question is, are those clouds rapidly destroyed by the stellar feedback, or do they just sit there forming stars and the stars are bubbling around, but they're not really destroying the clouds? These are quite different pictures physically of how the baryon cycle within galaxies works. Now, thankfully, you can distinguish between these two ideas very easily observationally, because in the first case, if a molecular cloud forms, 
assembles, forms stars, and then gets blown up by the feedback, then molecular clouds in the H2 regions of ionized hydrogen should rarely coexist. You form stars and the cloud gets blown up and then all you got is the stars. So you shouldn't see them in the same place really. In the second case, if that cloud is long lived and forms stars for many dynamical times, then you should be seeing the clouds and the young stars in the same place very frequently. Now with ALMA, we now have the uh, spatial resolution and the sensitivity in molecular gas to actually test this, to observe this directly. And that is what I'm showing here. So this is a nearby galaxy, NGC 300. And in blue, you see the molecular gas traced by CO with ALMA. And in red or pinkish, you see the young stellar regions, the H2 regions. And what you see here immediately is that not, if, you, if you're not colorblind, that is, so I can't actually see this. Uh, but what you're supposed to see here immediately is that they're not sitting in the same place. So the, the red and the blue are typically offset from one another. And it turns out that there is a way of turning this directly into the underlying timescale. So we developed a relatively simple statistical formalism, which Lucio mentioned in the introduction. We jokingly call that an uncertainty principle for star formation, which basically translates those little offsets into the underlying timescales. And it's very simple, but because of that, also quite fundamental. You can't really go wrong in making that connection. And what we do with that is we can predict how the gas to the stellar flux ratio here. So basically blue divided by red in this map changes as a function of the spatial scale when you focus on peaks of gas emission, of molecular gas emission, and when you focus on peaks of ionized emission, so the red. And it turns out that the shape of this diagram tells you what the underlying timescales are. So what you can do is you can make this measurement here in this map, where you put apertures on all of the peaks of the emission, and then you can fit this simple model to this sort of tuning fork shape. And if you do that, you get out the underlying evolutionary timescales. Basically assume a timeline, something like this, where you start with the molecular gas, at some point you get the young stars and they overlap for some amount of time. If we think carefully about what happens during that overlap time, that's where the action happens. That's, where, that's the time between the emergence of the first star in that cloud and the dispersal of the cloud. That's the effect of feedback. So this here is the feedback time scale. It's the time that the stellar feedback needs to blow up the cloud. And this is now showing for NGC 300, what I just showed, as a function of galactocentric radius, what we measure for that feedback time scale. And what we find here is that it's quite short. It's about one and a half mega years. That's way shorter than the time it takes for the first supernova to explode. So what we find here is that early feedback mechanisms before supernovae start detonating, actually destroy the molecular clouds in NGC 300. And this is the first time that we can really directly measure that. So this is one galaxy. Who knows it's the same in all galaxies? I don't. So with ALMA, and in particular here with the FANGS collaboration, we've now started to do this across the local galaxy population. And this is work by Melanie Chavance, and she initially did this now for of the order 10 galaxies. And you basically see, qualitatively speaking, you see the same result here. So there is environmental dependence, so we get different timelines between different galaxies. But by and large, we see that the clouds live between 10 and 30 million years. And accounting for the different properties of the, of the clouds in the different galaxies, that's about one dynamical time. So the clouds live fast lives. They collapse, form stars, and then the stars blow up the clouds between, between one and five mega years. So typically before supernova feedback which is about four mega years. So this is a simple picture, right? Because I'm saying, okay, we go from molecular ga uh, gas to massive stars, and then there's some overlap in between, but it's effectively a two-phase model. Of course, in the real universe, there is some time that molecular gas is, is not actually visible, is not there yet. So how long might the gas in those clouds be atomic before it actually becomes molecular? Can we try and answer that question too? And of course, deeply within the cloud, when the massive stars are there, we might not be able to see them because they're embedded. We look at that too. Now, it turns out that with uh, multi-wavelength observations, you can do exactly the same game. You can play exactly the same game and start measuring those timescales. So we um, just got uh, a large program approved on the first cycle of James Webb to start addressing this question. Is in the infrared, we can see exactly how long the stars are embedded. This is work carried out by Jayon Kim, who's a Melanie student. And then in addition with the SKA coming on, uh, hopefully this decade, 
we can start addressing this question here, is how long do the atomic gas clouds live before they become molecular? And that way we can start really building this comprehensive timeline of star formation and feedback in galaxies. I don't know where that happened. All right, good. So now what we can do is we can take those measurements and turn them directly into feedback models that we use in our simulations. And this is work by Ben Keller, and it basically works as such. What you can do is you can convert the time scales that we measure. So here's the feedback time scale. This is the star formation efficiency, and here's the cloud radius. You can turn those into the momentum input by the stellar feedback. And that's the quantity shown here. This is the terminal momentum. So it's the momentum at the end of the feedback phase, how much momentum you needed in total. But if you assume a self-similar solution, you can basically get this momentum as a function of time here. So what you can do is you can form a star particle and as a function of time, you know exactly how much momentum you need to put in. And there was one free parameter here, this alpha. And it turns out for reasonable values of alpha, you can test, you know, does the momentum input change and do the, does the impact on the resulting galaxy change? Now, this quantity we, we now have for all of our observations, because these are all observables except for this alpha value, which is constant to within a factor of two. And this is what this number looks like. Here is a function of galactocentric radius for the 10 nearby galaxies that I just showed. And given the wide variety of properties of the cloud population in those galaxies, this number is remarkably constant. It varies within maybe a factor two or three, but that's it. So this is a number we can measure and put in the simulations now. And it turns out, and that's very interesting, if you try and compare this to what you would expect to individual feedback mechanisms, so single scattering radiation pressure, here or radiative stellar wind, it turns out none of them work individually. And that makes sense because the feedback we observe is the combination of all other feedback mechanisms. And it's really hard to predict how these interact. It's probably nonlinear. Yeah. 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 No, so we, it's, we actually measure that as part of this formalism because if you have the cloud lifetime, and you have the galaxy-wide gas depletion time, then the integrated star formation efficiency is the ratio of these two quantities. So we actually measure that directly. So yeah, I should have mentioned that. But indeed, these, these things are, for that reason, are all observables. Yeah. So because no single mechanism works, using this empirical specific terminal momentum is really the only way of solving this nonlinear interplay between the different feedback mechanisms. So we've now put this into a new simulation, a new suite of galaxy simulations, which is called EMP for empirically motivated physics or electromagnetic pulse, whatever you prefer. And uh, what we do here is we use a repo and we use explicit ISM cooling. We track the chemical abundances of 36 elements in their isotopes so that we can actually start to do chemistry and see how the feedback impacts the, the uh, chemical abundances in the galaxies as well. We have uh, uh, a new star formation model that Yindra Genzior developed, who's here now. Uh, we have this new empirically motivated feedback model that is based on these observations. And we have a subgrid model for star cluster formation and evolution, which I'll uh, talk a little bit about in the next part of the talk. And as I said, we all do that on a moving mesh. And this is what it looks like. So this is a galaxy that is isolated, that is evolving using the stellar feedback that we observe in the real universe. So you see basically the clouds being dispersed here by feedback, there are little explosions going on everywhere. Now, what is, uh, of course, now the question is, okay, can we quantify what the impact is of adding this new empirical feedback model on the properties of the stars in this galaxy? And the one obvious quantity to look at is their correlation function, because what happens if you disrupt clouds by early feedback is you don't let them collapse as far. You stop the clouds from collapsing by blowing them up early. So you expect that the clustering of the stars at birth might be different than if you had let the clouds collapse very far. And it turns out that's exactly what we see. So this is the two-point correlation function, here showing for a run that only uses the supernovae, and here for two runs that use our empirical early feedback model for two different numbers of this alpha parameter. And you see it actually doesn't matter which alpha parameter we use, and this spans the range of plausible alphas. So you see that if you only use supernovae, the young stars are a lot more clustered. And if we add this empirical feedback, the stars form in a much more sort of diffuse, spatially diffuse way. Does that matter? Because, you know, this is only the clustering within the galaxy. It turns out it does matter. Here are the resulting outflow rates. So there's the mass loading, so it's the outflow rate in units of the star formation rate. 
And you see that we get an order of magnitude decrease in the mass loading within the galaxy because the stars are less clustered. So what that means is your global baryon cycle in the galaxy changes because we've just added this empirical feedback that deals with the pre-supernova feedback. Yeah, Pedro. I don't think so because, uh, well, one is we're using the super bubble feedback model from Ben. So we don't use a, we don't use a cooling shutoff. Uh, no, I don't. Yeah, 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 no, no. So here, what we do with the supernovae here actually is we use individual supernovae from a stochastically sampled IMF. So we, we basically deal with that self-consistently. So the, the, the supernova delay time in these simulations is not a free parameter. Okay, so we get, we get differences here in the global galaxy evolution that are, are important. We get an order of magnitude difference in the outflow rate. And also, if we now look at this sort of tuning fork diagram, here on the left, you see a simulation that only has this mechanical supernova feedback. And here on the right, we added the early feedback. And you see a qualitative difference here in what this decorrelation between gas and young stars look like. And in, the, in gray in the background are the observations. So we only get this right if we include the empirical feedback. Right. And it really tells us this is sort of the, the consistency check. Like if we get that right too, then we, we know we're probably on the right path. So here we see now very explicitly that by using observed feedback that the clustering of stars at birth changes and it changes the baryon cycle of galaxies globally. So it changes also how galaxies form stars over cosmic history. So let's now go have a look about at, at, at how stars form across cosmic history and galaxies? And can we use the stellar clustering within galaxies across cosmic time to learn something about galaxy formation and assembly? And the most obvious type of object to look at if you want to try and do that are globular star clusters. So here I'm showing a picture of one. Uh, globular clusters are typically old, of the order 10 giga years. They're typically massive, of the order 100,000 solar masses, and they're compact. So this is of the order 10 parsecs across here. And these objects formed one way or another in the early phases of galaxy formation. So if we learn how to use them to figure out what happened at that time, we can learn a lot about how galaxies like the Milky Way form. So the real questions we want to answer is, how did globular clusters form? And what do they tell us about the formation and assembly history of the Milky Way? And that is uh, the, these questions we've been trying to address with the eMosaics project. So this is a project that we've basically uh, built on top of the Eagle galaxy formation physics. And we coupled a subgrid model for star cluster formation and evolution to those galaxy formation simulations. And by making that connection, we can really for the first time trace exactly the formation and evolution of the complete star cluster population across cosmic history. And then ask the question, okay, do we get globular clusters at rate of zero? And what are their properties like? And what do they tell us about the galaxy uh, assembly? So uh, this is the movie I showed on the first slide. Contrast is not amazing. So I hope you, you get to see something other than just gray in a moment. Uh, but what you see here is the cosmological uh, assembly of a Milky Way mass galaxy. And at some point you'll see colored dots appearing. And the colored dots here are subgrid stellar clusters that form and evolve according to the local conditions within the galaxy. So we use the gas properties to determine what kinds of clusters form. We use the uh, tidal field tensor around each cluster at every time step to make it lose mass dynamically. And you see here indeed the clusters are, have different colors here that's indicating the metallicity. And not just that, you see here at some point on the left, you see another galaxy coming in that's bringing in its own globular clusters here. You notice that these are bluer than the clusters here in the middle. They have a different metallicity. So that already tells us something. It tells us that we can use some properties of the globular clusters that we see today to maybe say something about the types of galaxies that they formed in long ago. And that might tell us something about how the host galaxies formed. So just to summarize a little bit again, so we use the Eagle galaxy formation model here, which where we get the hydrodynamics, the gravitational dynamics, and the stellar evolution. And we connect it to the mosaic star cluster model where we uh, basically use those quantities here to calculate the fraction of star formation that occurs in clusters, the initial cluster mass function, and also the mass loss rates of the clusters across cosmic history so that we can really model, okay, what do we end up with at the present day? So we started doing this project with 25 cosmological zooms of Milky Way mass galaxies and the satellites, but these were not all. We ran hundreds of simulations to really try and understand exactly which 
elements of the subgrid model are important, which change our results and which our results are insensitive to. So when we, once we convince ourselves which ones are important and which ones are not, and which results we can trust, we then went ahead and simulated the 34 megaparsec volume that has of the order 100 Milky Ways and goes all the way up to a Fornax uh, mass galaxy cluster. So there are two important things that eMosaics taught us, and I'm going to talk mostly about the second. The first one eMosaics taught us is that globular clusters are the natural outcome of normal star formation at high redshift. Because that is the working assumption that we run eMosaics with. We form star clusters as byproducts of star formation according to the relations that we observe in the local universe. And what we see here is uh, an example where we show, we plot here in the, the dashed lines, the age distribution of young clusters forming at redshift zero in uh, eMosaics galaxies, so in simulated galaxies. And we compare it to the symbols here, which are observations. You see that the slope here on average is actually is very similar. And that's important because the age distribution here declines. You see fewer clusters at old ages. It's because clusters don't live forever. They get destroyed by tidal forces. So this shows that we model that reasonably well in eMosaics. The destruction of clusters proceeds in the right way. So this shows that we reproduce young cluster populations. Here we see, this is one example with many quantities that we look at, here we see the spatial distribution of the old globular clusters. And the gray lines or the thin gray lines here are again the simulations. The fat black line here is the observation of the Milky Way. And again, you see that these trace each other quite well. So the fact that we can simultaneously reproduce young cluster populations and old cluster populations with the same star cluster model tells us that the globular clusters are very similar to young clusters that we see forming today. It's just um, they formed under high redshift conditions. What I want to focus on is the next thing, because this gives us some confidence that we can use this cluster model to learn something about globular cluster formation and the assembly history of the Milky Way. So the next thing we learned is that globular clusters can be used to reconstruct galaxy formation and assembly. And historically, in the Milky Way, a really powerful tool to try and do this has been the age metallicity distribution of globular clusters. So here you see the age of, of globular clusters in the Milky Way, the observed age and the observed metallicity. And you see that there, this has a quite peculiar shape. It sort of has this bifurcation where you have a vertical branch and then this branch coming off here. And this branch coming off, turns out this one continues a bit further, but the data weren't there yet in 2010. It turns out that this sort of lower branch has a lower metallicity at the same age than, than this branch, if you continue it a little bit. It's not there, but imagine. And that means is that those clusters when forming at the same time at a lower metallicity means that they formed in lower mass galaxies. And as a result, this is what people call the satellite branch. They think that this, these clusters formed in other galaxies that were then accreted onto the Milky Way. Now in eMosaics, we can actually test this. So what you see here is uh, six different age metallicity distributions of globular clusters in eMosaics Milky Way analogs. And uh, the, the dots here are the globular clusters. They're color coded by galactocentric radius. And the contours are uh, the field stars. So what you see is whenever a galaxy forms a lot of field stars, it also forms a lot of globular clusters. So by and large, the points sort of trace the contours. But we also see qualitative differences between those different plots, right? By and large, they all do the same thing. They started at low metallicity long ago and they go to high metallicity recently, but there are differences. This one is very steep here and this one is very shallow, for instance. And it turns out that that actually directly traces the assembly history of the host galaxy. So here you see a couple, the, the merger trees of the same galaxies. You see that the steep one here, the one that enriched and grew very quickly, has a very rich merger tree, experienced a lot of mergers. Whereas this really shallow one here had very few mergers and probably grew slowly for that reason. So you see here that basically you can start connecting this directly to how the host galaxy formed. What we can also check now explicitly using those merger trees is that indeed those sort of low metallicity younger globular clusters that are sitting on the satellite branch here are indeed clusters that formed in satellite galaxies that were created later. We find in the simulations that that is correct. And what that allows us to do is we can now link individual globular clusters to the progenitor galaxies that they came from. We can look at groups of globular clusters that came from the same galaxy. Now, this is only using age and metallicity, but what is now amazing is that Gaia also gives us kinematics. So with Gaia, you can look at energy angular momentum space here 
and you can actually start to do clustering. This is only one projection, but you can look at many projections. You start to do clustering of the orbits of globular clusters in that space to figure out which groups of globular clusters came from the same galaxy. And Masari and collaborators did that for uh, uh, se several, most of the globular clusters in the Milky Way, and basically divided them up into uh, other than the main progenitor, so that's the Milky Way itself, divided up into five different groups with common progenitors. And then what we did is we used eMosaics to learn what the properties were of the galaxies that these groups of globular clusters came from. And to do that, we trained an artificial neural network on the distributions of the globular cluster ages, metallicities, and orbits of the subgroups that came from each of those different progenitor galaxies. And we trained the neural network to link these properties to the mass of the galaxy that these clusters formed in and the redshift at which it merged with the Milky Way. And the goal here was to use that to reconstruct the merger tree of the Milky Way. So yeah, uh, what I just mentioned, we used those input distributions, the global cluster age, Midlisty, the apocenter of their orbit and the eccentricity, and then predict these two quantities here on the right. So the satellite galaxy mass and its accretion redshift. And we do that many times, and then we get posterior distributions for each of those five galaxies that tells us exactly what their properties were. So here are those five galaxies. So each of those panels is a different galaxy. We got a galaxy here that we called Kraken. Uh, that was, was a new galaxy, actually, Gaia Enceladus, you might have heard of because it got a lot of press attention. Uh, the progenitor of the Helmi stream, Sequoia, and Sagittarius here, which is a well-known galaxy. So you see here then each panel shows the PDF of the stellar mass of the galaxy. And you see different lines in each panel. And that is because for some globular clusters, it's not obvious which galaxy it belonged to. So there is some ambiguity here. And we vary the membership. We say, okay, well, this global cluster, we're not really sure. So what happens if we leave it out? So we basically, we try all possible permutations to see how important that impact is. And it turns out for most of the galaxies, it doesn't really affect the posterior distributions. For Sequoia, it does a little bit, but by and large, it doesn't do much. So looking at those results, we see that there are three galaxies that had a relatively similar but high mass, high-ish. It's actually still quite low. So a few hundred, solar, a few hundred million solar masses uh, for Kraken, Gaia, Enceladus, and Sagittarius. The other two galaxies had a, had a lower mass when they created by a factor of two to three. And because these galaxies all had the same mass, you can then look at differences in their orbital properties to figure out at which redshift they might have accreted. And it turns out, despite having very similar masses, these three galaxies here accreted at vastly different times. So Kraken was the first one to accrete, beyond redshift two, that was. Gaia Enceladus about 10 giga years ago, and then the Sagittarius merger we actually still see ongoing. It's very recent. So because those redshifts are so different and the masses are so similar, you can calculate the mass ratio. So how massive was the Milky Way at the time of that merger? And it turns out that Kraken was actually the most major merger that the Milky Way ever experienced. It's still very tiny. This is in stellar mass. The stellar mass ratio was one to 30 at that time. So in other words, the Milky Way never had a major merger. Maybe that's why we exist. Yep. Um, what about the other two? Uh, hasn't merged yet, but yes, that's coming. Yeah. Mm. Depends on whether you call what, what you call major. I'm not sure I would call that one major, but yeah, yeah. So um, putting these results together, we can start building the merger tree of the Milky Way. So that's the re result I'm showing here. So the color here indicates stellar mass. So you see the stellar mass of the Milky Way growing here as a function of time, and you see the different galaxies here being accreted at different times. The uncertainty PDF of their accretion time is shown here. So we, we were able to do this for five progenitors, but based on the global statistics of the global cluster population of the Milky Way, we expect another 10, just we haven't found them yet. But it should be possible using not just Gaia, but also chemical abundances to start looking for the progenitors of those presumably smaller galaxies. And presumably they also merged longer ago. So they're harder to find. Now, I'm excited by this because drawing merger trees used to be a simulation thing. And the fact that we can now start doing this for observed galaxies, I think is really, really fascinating. It just makes me feel like a little kid. Um, the other thing that I think is nice here is that Kraken, we actually predicted with Emus eggs. We found an excess of globular clusters in a certain part of phase space. And we said, hey, there should have been a galaxy that accreted here that we didn't know yet. 
and we called it Kraken. And it turns out not just the globular clusters, but also its stellar debris has now been found. So this is really nice. Again, gives us some confidence that this is real science that you can do here, and we can start to do this for real galaxies. Yeah. When it, when it emerged, because in cosmology, emerge yeah. happens over the halo, right? Yes, yeah. That's a different thing. We, we operate on the stars, yeah. And it's, is, is it the, in the disk, or is it the halo? It's when our clustering algorithm can no longer distinguish it in, in EMS eggs. So <laughs> it's a little bit subjective, right? So it depends, there, there is some leeway in the exact times, depending on the definition that you use. Yeah. Yeah, so you, when you compute, going back to your honest question, when you compute yeah. the mass ratio, yeah. You're computing the mass ratio between the, the main galaxy, even stellar mass only, between yeah. the main galaxy yeah. and the satellite at the time. At the time of accretion. Time of, yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. A, it's a Milky Way at that time. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. And that's why the difference in accretion redshifts matters so much for the merger ratio, right? Because the Milky Way had different masses at those times. Okay. So I've now discussed how we can use stellar clustering to predict how the baryon cycle is driven within galaxies. And then once you sort of understand that, how you can then use the products of the star formation process within galaxies through stellar clustering to trace the formation and assembly histories of galaxies. But let's now zoom in. Let's zoom in to smaller scales within sort of the stellar clustering to see what stellar clusters do to planet formation within them. So this is a, now a much smaller scale simulation. We're looking at only uh, sort of a parsec across. Uh, where we see a molecular cloud collapsing hierarchically under the influence of self-gravity. And this is characteristic. Star formation is hierarchically structured. And in the sort of the dense substructures here, external photo, photo evaporation from nearby massive stars is a really common process. And also what you see here, some stars being thrown out through dynamical interactions. Like if the substructure is bound, then also the dynamics can throw around stars. And the question that we would have is, okay, can these processes, these environmental processes, impact the evolution of the protoplanetary disks around those stars and thereby the planet formation process? Now, it turns out we already know the answer to that question for more than 25 years, because HST already demonstrated here in the Orion Nebula that, yes, the protoplanetary disks there are actually impacted by the surroundings. So you see these sort of beautiful structures where you, you get these shocks, shock fronts, and weird sort of asymmetric uh, morphologies of the protoplanetary disks around those stars. And that is driven by external photo evaporation. You can link it very nicely to the nearby massive stars in Orion. So we know that this happens, and you can actually quantify this. So this is showing actually the first paper through which I got interested in this topic um, from, from 2012, uh, worked on this with Maria de Juan Ovelar. We uh, looked basically at a literature compilation of protoplanetary disk radii across the solar neighborhood and looked at what their sizes were as a function of the local stellar number density in projection, because it's observationally. And what we found is that at the very highest densities, there was a statistically de detectable and significant drop here, or a deficit of extended disks. So at the highest stellar densities, there were no big disks. So at the time we compared that to a simple model for dynamical truncations, I now believe it's actually due to external photo evaporation. And it turns out you see similar processes here when you look at the masses of the disks. So here you see a separation from Sigma Orionis, so a massive star in the Orion Nebula. And as a function of the distance from that massive star, you see that massive disks, so you look at the, the, the round data points here, massive disks do not exist close to Sigma Orionis again, is an indication that it's the photo evaporation from that star that drives the disk masses to be lower. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But people start to see similar things using CO. It's just we needed ALMA to do that. Right? So this was still a little bit early, but indeed there's been follow-up work here. So you can try and model this. And this is a, a simulation that we did uh, a couple of years ago now, where we basically modeled a little stellar cluster and we put uh, gaseous disks around those stars. And then we looked at, okay, how, for, for what kind of densities do we get uh, dynamical perturbations of those protoplanetary disks that actually disperses the disks? And it turns out that 
that uh, it actually happens at roughly the same uh, uh, density that we saw observationally a couple of slides ago. So that tells us, okay, we, we, we can actually try and understand this. But what is important going forward is we need to figure out what fraction of the planet population or the stellar population is actually affected by these types of processes, right? It's very nice to get anecdotal evidence, to, to look at a couple of regions and go like, okay, this is apparently important here, but you need to know exactly for which fraction of stars this is important and under which circumstances exactly. So it turns out you can try and solve that problem uh, analytically. And the key uh, ingredient that you need for that is the density distribution of the stars. So when stars are born, at which ambient stellar density are they born? And can we then use that to predict exactly how important dynamical perturbation and, and photo evaporation are? So to, to make that prediction, what we uh, use here is the fact that the gas density probability distribution of the interstellar medium is a log normal. And the width of that distribution increases with the gas pressure. So if the gas is a higher pressure, then you get more extreme density variations. And what you can then do is you can basically, so we have this for the gas. Now at low densities, the gas has a long freefall time. So it takes forever to collapse and form stars. Whereas at high densities, the gas has a short freefall time and it can collapse very quickly. Now, as a result, here at the low density end, you get a low star formation efficiency. There's only a small fraction of that gas that turns into stars. But at the high density end, a very large fraction of that gas turns into stars. So you can actually then convert the gas peak density PDF into a stellar density PDF. And what that means is here on the left, you get sort of sparse associations. And on the right, you get dense stellar clusters. All right, so this you can then use. Now it turns out that the, the, again, the key ingredient here is the gas pressure. That determines how wide this PDF is. But if you assume that a galaxy disk is sitting in hydrostatic equilibrium, then the gas pressure is set entirely by three galaxy scale quantities. It's set by the gas surface density of the disk, by the angular velocity, so how quickly it rotates, the rotation curve basically, and the tumor Q stability parameter, so how stable the disk is against self-gravity. And with that, you can predict what this density PDF looks like. Now, if you then have the density PDF, you have the stellar density PDF. And that allows you to predict what the initial cluster mass distribution is, allows you to stochastically sample the stellar initial mass function to calculate the local far UV radiation field, therefore the external photo evaporation rate that's driven by those massive stars. And also, because you have the density, you can calculate the dynamical destruction rate by stellar flybys. So we can now predict what the disk lifetime is due to these external processes as a function of galaxy scale properties. And that is what we did here in this paper. So here, this is showing as a function of the stellar number density here and the far UV flux density for solar neighborhood conditions. So we basically looked, okay, what do we know about the solar neighborhood? Plug in those numbers. And the gray here is showing a two dimensional histogram of where we expect stars to form. The bands here are observations. So that is where we observe stars to form. And we see that that actually matches relatively well to what the prediction is. So that again gives us a little bit of confidence that you know, this is probably plausible. And the blue lines here indicate what the lifetimes are of the disks under these conditions. So the horizontal part here is set by photo evaporation. Basically, as the far UV flux density goes up, the disks live shorter. The vertical part here is set by dynamics. As the density goes up, the disks are dispersed more or, or are perturbed more easily by dynamical encounters. So, so that is what causes this sort of weird shape. What we see is that in the solar neighborhood, only a few percent of the disks are disrupted within a mega year by external effects. Now, internal photo evaporation from the host star disperses disks within about three mega years, maybe to 10, something like that. So this is not necessarily a major impact. However, if we now change the conditions here to what would happen in the center of the Milky Way, in the central molecular zone, where gas pressures are a lot higher, you see that the distribution ends up in a very different part of parameter space here. And again, over plotting some of the sort of classical stellar clusters that, that exist there, they cover the same range. And what we see there is that more than 90% of the protoplanetary disks is disrupted in less than a mega year. In other words, it's the standard in those types of environments that the external photo evaporation blows up your protoplanetary disks on very short timescales, well before the house star could have done it. Now that is important because most of the star formation in the history of the universe occurred under these types of conditions, not under these types of conditions that we have now in the solar neighborhood, because 
you know, the cosmic star formation rate peaked at redshift one. These are the typical conditions that we should be looking at. What does a high redshift galaxy look like? Not like the boring situation that we have here in the solar neighborhood where nothing happens. No, it's much more like the center of the galaxy. So if we want to understand the origin of the planet population across cosmic time, we have to look at this. So yeah, what we get out, if we look at the uh, disk lifetime distribution is here in red, we have the sort of the galactic center distribution and in blue, we have the solar neighborhood distribution. We find that disks live about five times shorter in the galactic center than in the solar neighborhood. So about half a mega year. And then from the main yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. So it turns out here indeed, there are very few mm -hmm. disks that are sitting here. Like eventually, like had there not been photo evaporation, yeah, the, those lines would have gone up. But it's because there is photo evaporation that we don't really have to care about that. It's only in low mass regions where the uh, IMF is not well sampled that you start to care about it. So for instance, here, this is lupus, very nearby, relatively high density. It's still not there, but you see that it doesn't have the, the amount of photo evaporation that you would expect. Yeah, okay. So what we see here is that stellar clustering has a very immediate impact on the uh, survival of protoplanetary disks. Now, of course, the key question is, does that have any impact at all on the planet population over longer timescales? And that's a really difficult question because the solar system is four and a half gig years old. We have no idea where the solar system formed. So how do we solve that problem? How do we determine if the planet population at large has somehow been affected by stellar clustering in its external environment? So not just the solar system, but pretty much most of the known planets have ages more than a giga year. And that means that whatever sort of stellar overdensity that they formed in has long been erased. We can no longer see that. But it is possible that some of the structure that they formed in might persist in phase space, in position velocity space. So it might be that some of those stars are still moving in the same direction. So if we would have a way of mapping how all stars in the solar neighborhood are moving, then we might be able to try and look for these types of groups. And that is exactly what Gaia now allows us to do. So what we've done is we've taken all known exoplanet host stars for which we have radial velocities and construct the six dimensional phase space with three velocity components and three position components and determine the phase space density of other stars near these planetary systems. We checked for biases. It turns out the selection functions here are a total nightmare. So you need to be extremely careful and try and factor in, find a metric that is not too sensitive to detection limit problems. And then we compared the planet properties as a function of this ambient phase space density. So do the demographics of the planet population change with what this phase space density does? And again, we checked for biases afterwards and I'll show a couple of examples. So this is what, what this looks like. So these are two different planetary systems shown in physical space. So here we have HD something sitting right here. And here we have WASP-12 sitting right here. And you see that basically in physical space, so this is Y and X, there is no substructure. This is just a scatter plot, right? This is just the field. But if we now look in velocity space, we see something very different. So here, this is showing the azimuthal rotational velocity within the Milky Way, and this is showing the radial velocity. You see this planetary system here, like, yeah, there is substructure in this planetary system here is sitting outside of that co-moving group. This planetary system here is sitting right in the middle of that co-moving group. So we're starting to see differences here, and we can actually quantify those differences. So the way we've done that is we looked here at the, the normalized phase space density. So, so far I just showed proje projections, but you can do this in 6D. You can calculate some form of normalized phase space density. And what we find in general is that the distribution of stars around those planetary systems and of their phase space densities is typically bimodal. So you have sort of a low density component and then a high density component. And what you can do is you can calculate through Gaussian mixture modeling, you can calculate the probability that your exo exoplanetary system is part of this high density component. So what is the probability that we've got a planet sitting in what we call an overdensity? So this example here, WASP-12, is so the vertical line here is clearly sitting in an overdensity. There's a probability of 95% that it's sitting there. Whereas this HD something here has a very small probability of sitting in the overdensity. So this is what we call field, and this is what we call our density. Now, before I continue, I should point out is we do not know if these phase space densities reflect 
the clustering at birth or if those phase space densities might have formed later. We don't know this. This is purely as an empirical way of trying to look at this. And I'll actually show in a bit that it does not reflect the birth environment. These overdensities formed later. Okay, so just uh, to show that we checked for biases. So this is an example of the many biases that we looked at, but this is showing the stellar mass, the stellar metallicity, stellar age, and the distance distributions of uh, the exoplanet host systems in the field shown in blue and in overdensity shown in red. So what you see here is that after applying those cuts in stellar mass and stellar age, the mass metallicity and age distributions are all consistent with being drawn from the same distribution. There are no significant differences in host stellar properties there. There is a difference in the distance distributions. So field host stars are closer to Earth in general. But if we cut here at a distance of 300 parsecs, it turns out that those distance distributions become indistinguishable and they don't change our results. So that tells us that the difference in distance distribution does not drive biases. So what do things look like? This is what the exoplanet population looks like when dividing into field and over densities. Here, so what I'm showing here is the semi-major axis, so the distance from the star where the planet is orbiting and the planet mass. And here in this box here, you've got the whole Jupiter population. So there are massive planets that are close by and then most planets are sort of sitting along this other sequence. Now, the immediate thing we see here is that there, there is a qualitative difference between both populations. And in particular, in overdensities, the uh, semi-major axes of the planets are an order of magnitude smaller than in the field. So the planets are orbiting way closer to the host star. And not just that, if you look at the incidence of hot Jupiters, well, you can just ask a question. If you see a hot Jupiter, do you think it's an overdensity or in the field? There, right? That's where they're all sitting. We find that here, about 30% um, of, of the hot Jupiters here are, wait, no, I should, 30% of the planets here are sitting in this hot Jupiter box in overdensities, and here it's only 13%. And what we find in general, if you just look at a hot Jupiter, 92% of them reside in overdensities. So clearly there is something about those overdensities that may, might have made the hot Jupiters one way or another. So we've tried for more than a year to get rid of this result because we thought it was suspicious. So we tried to get rid of the result by varying the threshold probabilities that we use to classify the planetary systems into field or overdensities. We tried to make different cuts in stellar age, metallicity, distance. We tried to cut by the way in which the exoplanets have been detected. So only look at transit systems, only look at radial velocity systems. We even restricted ourselves to single observatories, so say only use Kepler. We couldn't get rid of the result. So if anyone has an idea of something that we missed, please let me know because we're still trying to get rid of the results and it doesn't work. So if we for now assume that it's right, it means that stellar clustering shapes planetary systems. And that is, I think, quite interesting. So next to this result that I just showed about just the planet demographics at large, here's another couple of results that we found. So we found that the multiplicity of planetary systems actually is also affected by stellar clustering. So there is a, a, a known result from Kepler, it's called the Kepler dichotomy, is that there is an excess of single planet systems. So here's showing the number of planets per system, basically as of the, the, the distribution of that number. And what we find is that the excess of single planet systems exists mostly in the overdensities, so in the red line here. So in overdensities, you find more single planet systems than in the field. And here that's shown again is by, by basically taking the ratio between both lines. Here. So that suggests that one way or another, overdensities are capable of disrupting planetary systems. We also find that the planet radii within a single planetary system, it's known that these are correlated, it's called peas in a pod. And we find that this uniformity of the planet radii, how similar the planets are, is stronger in overdensities. Now in overdensities, as we've seen in the previous results, it's plausible that the planetary system has been shuffled around somehow. This suggests that even after shuffling the system around, the radii stay similar and may even become more similar. So it suggests that planets don't only know about their neighboring planets, 
they know about the properties of the planet in the entire system that they're sitting in. So there's some form of uniformity between planet properties within a single system. And then finally, there's another major Kepler result is that there is uh, this thing called the radius valley. So this is showing the planet radius. Here is a function of orbital period. And here you've got sub Neptune planets. So these are low mass gas planets. And here you've got super earths and these are rocky. And typically this is explained by the idea that the Neptunes here lost their atmospheres and turned into super earths there. So basically they, they go across this radius valley. What we find now is that there are no super earths in the field. All fields planets here are sub Neptunes. So it suggests again that the overdensities play some role in turning sub Neptunes into super earths, making them get rid of their atmospheres. So to, to conclude this bit, is what, what is now the physical nature of those overdensities? Right? That's what we want to know. How do they affect the planetary systems? Now, it turns out with Gaia, we can look at this. And I'm showing here the, the azimuthal velocity within the Milky Way as a function of galactocentric radius. And what we find here is we project the distribution is that the red here, so the distribution and velocity of the overdensities, matches the large scale ripples that we see in phase space with Gaia. And these extend over many kiloparsecs. So we've got kiloparsec scale waves and ripples in the galactic disk, and that is what those overdensities correspond to. And the stellar populations within those overdensities are heterogeneous. So here showing the host stellar ages, you see that they have very wide age distributions here for different individual overdensities. So they're, they're, they're uh, heterogeneous in age, they're also heterogeneous in chemistry, and it turns out almost all of them are thin disk. So field versus overdensity is not a simple thin versus thick disk. And then finally, we see that between the different uh, overdensities, we've got different hot Jupiter to cold Jupiter ratios. So the planetary, planetary system demographics are affected in different ways in different overdensities. There's just so much here that we don't really understand yet, but that we need to start exploring. So what we see so far is that galaxy evolution is somehow capable of affecting planetary system architectures over long timescales, giga year timescales after planet formation. And with the upcoming facilities, we can actually link this, link the galaxy evolution to planet properties, right? We, we are now on the verge of getting large statistical samples that we can actually start doing this systematically. And not just of the architectures of what I've shown now, but also of the atmosphere. So with Ariel and uh, the LIFE initiative, which I'm both involved in, the goal is to actually start linking this now to how the atmospheres of the planets might be affected. And therefore say how stellar clustering and galaxy evolution might affect the ubiquity of potentially habitable planets. So, not only does stellar clustering drive the baryon cycle on large scales within galaxies, and we can use it to learn something about galaxy evolution, it also has a major impact on the planet population. And to wrap up, I'd like to bring this back to the movie I showed at the beginning. So, in this movie, or in e-mosaics here, we're following the formation and evolution of stellar clusters across cosmic history. And we now know that those stellar clusters have an impact on the planet population and potentially the ubiquity of life. And if we look in these simulations at how many stars formed in clusters as a function of redshift, we see that there is this global trend here. So at higher redshift, a larger fraction of stars formed in stellar clusters, which means that a higher redshift, a larger fraction of planetary systems was affected by the environment. And today, only few are. But you see these other features here. It's not like a gradual trend. You see those spikes. These spikes are galaxy mergers. So we've got megaparsec scale events that end up affecting the AU scale properties of planetary systems. This is a very direct connection now. And it turns out in the solar system, if you actually look at the star formation history in the solar neighborhood, the solar system formed at the end of a starburst that was triggered by the Sagittarius merger. So, right, we saw that there. So if the solar system did not form in relative isolation, then looking at nearby planetary systems forming today might not actually tell us that much about our own origins might be that the sun formed in a very different environment than how we see planet formation today. And we don't really know. We need to explore this. So I'll wrap up there. So I've been talking about how stellar clustering can connect the formation and evolution of galaxies to the formation and evolution of us. And that stellar clustering drives the baryon cycle within galaxies, disrupts molecular clouds through early pre-supernova feedback, which we can now use as subgrid models in galaxy evolution. I've talked about how simulating the entire stellar cluster population allows us to use globular clusters to trace and reconstruct the assembly history of the Milky Way. 
I've talked about how protoplanetary disk lifetimes are shortened at high gas densities and pressures because of external photoevaporation, mostly, and also dynamical interactions. And then finally, that stellar clustering shapes the planet population in terms of the architectures of the planetary systems, but presumably also the properties of the planets themselves, as we saw in the transition from sub-Neptunes to super-Earths. So it might be that our existence is one of the biggest multi-scale astrophysics problems. And it might seem that trying to understand this complex ecosystem is, is very challenging. But I hope to have convinced you that we can start to make this problem tractable. We can start connecting those scales and different physical processes. And what that means is that when faced with this challenge, we shouldn't look scared, but cool. So thank you and sorry for going over. We can have questions now. Uh, maybe we start from, from the chat, if it's from the chat, from the Zoom, if there is anyone there? Nope, no. not from the chat. Maybe we go to the audience. Who wants to start? Robert. <laughs> so I was uh, very intrigued by the beginning of the talk when you talked about the uh, early feedback mm -hmm. um, that you sent to the infrared impurity. And, yep. um, you know, I have two kind of questions related to this, right? So the one is, you know, does it, I mean, I understand you just have empirical, you know, it's an empirically motivated model. But do you have some kind of physical model that, that is able to match it in the end? I mean, I mean, should, I mean how much trust should we put into such a model if, if you can't, if you can't, uh, since you come up with at least some combination of physical models that, that explain this? I don't think there exists a physical model that can match this. And the reason is that we're operating here at physical resolutions that do not, are unable to resolve the relevant physics. So we're talking about cooling and turbulent mixing on 1000 AU scales being relevant. And there's no way you can try and resolve that in a cosmological simulation. So this is, that, that's why we ended up going this route. It's really a fundamental problem. If you want to understand the nonlinear interplay between different feedback mechanisms, you're going to need resolutions that we're decades away from achieving. And therefore, this is, it's cheating, I admit. We just go to the real universe and try and get the answer. But I think it's the only way in trying to get at that nonlinear interplay in, in a way that might give us some confidence. Because yes, there is the other option. And I, you know, I know that I need to choose my words carefully, but the, there's the other option of, of trying to model every mechanism individually and just adding it together. And then hoping that the, um, the resolution of the simulations allows that interplay to be accurate, but we don't know that. And that's one of the reasons here too, that we decided to go just for momentum directly because it's more tractable, right? And you can put it in directly. Um, it will be entirely true. So for instance, where, where I see the future of this going, it's like at the moment we've done this based on a sample of 10 nearby galaxies. Uh, we've already done the experiment now. Uh, so, so I should actually, whoops. We've done the experiment now, um, or Jayon has done the experiment for uh, up to a hundred galaxies. So the complete FANG sample, the results are qualitatively similar, but that is because it's the local universe. We have no idea what the terminal momentum was at Richard two. So where we need to go is we need the ELT and we need long baseline ALMA to just point at a Richard two galaxy for a hundred hours. And then we can start answering this question under Richard two conditions. And then we get to environmental dependencies that maybe tell us something about which physical mechanisms are, are driving the empirical momentum and which physical mechanisms might be important in different physical environmental regimes. But we need statistics for this. And I think at the moment, observationally, that's still too expensive. I hope that answers your question a little bit. I know it's not the most satisfactory answer, but I don't think we can do better at the moment. More questions? Okay. Yeah, this um, delayed feedback, I seem to recall, I'm not asking in this field, mm -hmm. but I seem to recall that this has been invoked in the past. Yeah. Uh, just not based on any direct observations as you've done. To what extent uh, are those earlier approaches of you know, delaying feedback similar to what you're doing? And 
so so we now no longer delay feedback so what we do is we start putting in feedback from moment zero and that is because we have this early feedback that we can basically that we put in oh i should have actually i'm getting a low battery uh, warning so maybe i should plug in um so we um we now start putting in the feedback from uh, the very beginning uh, here. So this is showing basically what the momentum is that has been put in by time t and at t equals zero at zero, but it starts increasing immediately. Um, so I would say that the comparison between what we're doing now and what people have done in the past is not necessarily to uh, people who've been using delayed supernova feedback, but to other efforts of people who've been putting in early feedback, pre-supernova feedback. And then uh, I think the analogy to what I just said to Robert is probably the strongest. So there are other groups who try and put in early feedback from t equals zero onwards, but they do it based on individual feedback mechanisms. So uh, what is the momentum input from stellar winds starting from t equals zero? What's the uh, effect of photoionization starting from t equals zero and radiation pressure. You put all of those in, you add them up. But then the problem is, is the impact of those mechanisms on the surrounding interstellar medium, uh, the mixing of, of the, uh, the flow and the mixing of the chemical elements is very hard to model at the resolutions that these uh, simulations operate at. So as a result, you don't know if those sort of combinations of physically motivated individual feedback mechanisms gives you, give you the right answer. And what we try to show here is that if you take the results from the real universe, that it gives you the right answer. It just, what you then miss is you don't know what the physical mechanism is that does it. That, that, that's the trade-off. Or it's just a follow-up question, maybe mm -hmm. a bit naive, but uh, maybe you have actually shown it. But um, so now you have this empirical model mm -hmm. Other models are physically motivated and calibrated, right? Yeah. yeah. So now if you use your empirical model, for example, for luminosity functions, mm -hmm. does it match? Luminosity functions of, galaxy of, gal of the galaxy population. That's where we're going. So we don't know the answer yet, but indeed, like the, the moment, um, right, the moment you see this, you get an order of magnitude difference in the macroscopic outflow rate from your galaxy. galaxy. You want to know what the impact is on the galaxy demographics. And that is the next step. So we're currently running the, uh, the next suite of zooms where we've put in this feedback model. And then we can start answering those questions. And also like, uh, sorry to <laughs> interrupt the end, but yeah. also like other very interesting question is how, you know, these, these discussions about needing very strong feedback, for mm -hmm. example, to have core dwarf galaxies. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah that you can try to do with this. Exactly, so we, we I mean, these, these are all the exciting questions. I completely agree. This is exactly where we wanna be going with this. Uh, so far, it's just been the technical development and now we can actually do the models and, and learn what it does physically. But indeed, I completely expect that there might be an impact here on what happens in terms of outflow rates from dwarfs. And therefore it will undoubtedly have impacts on, on what we think about dark matter in dwarfs, what we think about ultra diffuse galaxies and things like that. Um, in the background, you show a very high resolution yeah. galaxy. Yeah. Um, what resolution is required? Ah, great question. I, uh, yeah, I don't have the plot here, but it's in the paper. So we've done a resolution test, and it turns out that uh, this model is converged well between particle masses of 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 solar masses. Uh, if you go lower, uh, so higher resolution, okay. lower particle masses, then it turns out one of the assumptions of the model no longer works. Because what we're assuming here is that we can trace sort of molecular clouds to H2 regions and so on. If your resolution becomes too high, you start resolving those regions into individual particles, which means that your sources of feedback are now distributed throughout your cloud. And we're actually working here with a central feedback source. That's how we calculate the terminal momentum. So because of that, you get interacting feedback shells within your clouds, you get momentum cancellation, and you're no longer putting the right amount of momentum. So it's actually designed to work down to resolutions of, or, of the order 10 to the four solar masses. You go to a higher resolution, you need other physics. 
Right. And yeah, I was, I was going to ask a similar question, okay. but yep. uh, then I can ask a follow-up question. The standard mass, right? So here, mm -hmm. of course, you evolve it only for some time scale like yep. media here, and it's not cosmological, but no. the standard mass that you get at the end must be different, right? In, in, in the old supernova only so, framework and in the new one. I don't know how much it would change, but because the winds are weaker, essentially. So it be. turns out that for this simulation, the star formation history is the same. Okay. Other than the initial settling of the disk, mm -hmm. as you always have in an isolated mm -hmm. model, uh, the, the star formation rate is actually very similar. I think that would be different for cosmological yeah. boundary conditions, right? Yeah. So I think that's a relic of the fact that this is isolated, but I don't know. Like we need to see that uh, going forward. You had a question. Yeah, okay. I was just curious from a current on the sample of sort of planetary disk. Mm -hmm. Is there a, like a variation in the, in the clustering of those mm -hmm. clusters? Or? The thing is, so that's a great question. Uh, this is really hard to look at. Sorry. Uh, this is really hard to look at in the solar neighborhood uh, because ALMA can't see very far. And, like the, the complete list limit just kicks in at some point. And as a result, we're very limited into the range of environments that we can probe with ALMA. In the solar neighborhood, we only have relatively disappointing star forming regions. So as a result, um, I doubt that we would be able to statistically measure the impact on protoplanetary disks. There are ALMA programs that have been submitted but are refusing to get approved to do this for um, more starbursty environments. So there are a number of massive clusters in the galactic disk where ALMA can do this. Um, it would be great if the time allocation committee agreed. And then, and then we can start to do this. But I mean, it will happen at some point over the next years because it's a no-brainer. But uh, it's not been done yet. Yeah. Lawrence, I, I have a question about the part where you show that there's some sort of difference in the planetary mm -hmm. population depending if you're on the field, in the field, or um, and you mentioned that you tried to sort of get rid of this result. Mm -hmm. and that it was suspicious. And I was wondering if it was suspicious because it makes too much sense? Yes. Uh, okay, yeah. okay. So it's too, it's exactly too... what you would expect, it's... right? Well, or, or... I mean, nobody ever showed it, but if you woke me up in the middle of the night at age, <laughs> at age 10 and asked me, hey, you put a lot of stars together, do you think the planets will look the same as here? I'd be like, well, no. But that's what a kid would say. It's not what an astrophysicist would say. Mm -hmm. I think it does make sense it's astrophysically. It's so the context here is obviously is that I work on stellar clustering. Isn't it amazing that it turns out it also affects planetary systems? <laughs> so clearly, like you know, you, you squeeze your arm and you go like this can't be can't be right, can it? But it makes so much sense. Of course it should happen. Uh, it's too good to be true. Um, we must have overlooked something. Like, if, if this is such a strong signal, why has nobody else found it before? That's always my first response. If I see something new, that if I find something new, I'm like, okay, nobody's done this before, I must be wrong. And of course, that's a, that's a very incorrect approach, uh, but it's good to second guess yourself. And, and yeah, we've been trying. Um, there's the other element, right? You go into, so, the, the, the field of exoplanetary demographics is extremely, uh, um, in, in that field is extremely, extremely important, important to consider, to consider biases bias because the selection, the selection functions, functions of, of your, your planet, planet surveys are complicated. So if you go into that field as somebody who doesn't work on that, you've got to be very, very careful. And that is why we spend so much time thinking about how can we do this in a way that is not, or at least to the best of our abilities, is not sensitive to those biases. Still, I mean, I think within the field, this is by no means an accepted result, right? And people are still wanting us to make all kinds of sample cuts to try and see if, if the result persists. But at this point, we've tried everything and it's still there, so. Maybe a question to mm -hmm. some kind of people that are definitely in the room. Does it make sense that if you disrupt the disk more quickly, you get less planets and closer in? Well, yeah. before somebody answers that question, 
these over densities are not relics from birth. Yeah, exactly. So it's not obvious mm -hmm. that this is caused by the early disruption of the protoplanetary disk. And I personally think it might be caused by a late time disruption, presumably by dynamics. The problem there is, though, is that the time scale for dynamical interactions in sort of the galactic field well after Earth is so long that that shouldn't happen either. So we don't really know why this is happening. All we know is that it seems to be happening. But, but you, could also, you could also imagine that for some reason, even if it's not intuitively obvious, mm -hmm. you had a higher star formation, sorry, higher planet formation efficiency. In a, yeah. in a region where you have a higher over density. Right, right. So, so it, there, there might be some form of covariance, yeah. right? Exactly. You say, okay, if you're yeah. sitting in over density now, yeah. that is covariant with your birth environment yeah, exactly. having been different. Yeah. However, uh, I think this is relevant here, is that we roughly know for some of those over densities how long they've existed. And they consist of planets that are both younger and older than the existence time scale of those over densities. Okay. So and that to me suggests that it is a late time event. Mm -hmm. It's not actually covariance with birth. Mm -hmm. But obviously at that point, you really, you dive into the small number statistics because yeah. here every <laughs> vertical line is a planetary system. You see that for individual over densities, sometimes you don't have that many. Yeah. So oh, well, this is becoming a little bit difficult. <clears throat> but, but to me, this is both fascinating and puzzling and probably therefore fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Well, I, I understand cool. now why it's more interesting than what it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but thank you. It's a really good question. Yeah. Okay. So I think, unless there are urgent questions, we we'll probably have to close here and thank again our speaker for a very nice talk.